So the library's uh, opportunity for inviting Nora Volkow, the famous Nora Volkow, uh, uh, is centered on a book. Except in this case, it's, it's not just a book. It's five volumes of neuroscience text uh, with something over 4,000 pages. And we intended it to be written at a more didactic level and a simpler level than Eric Kandel, uh, Eric Kandel's text. I'm not sure that we achieved that. But what we did achieve is the primary purpose for doing it to begin with, which was a philanthropic purpose. This book is delivered free in all of the poorest countries of the world. Uh, the, the countries, that is, with the uh, lowest G D GDP per capita, and those, as you know, would be in Eastern Europe, Africa, certain parts of South America. South America is complicated. Uh, and Southeast Asia. So uh, we've done the d distribution. We know that it's worked. We've gotten a lot of help from Ebro and also from UNESCO. And also it helps to have friends and people who used to be in your lab who now work in those areas and who guarantee the distribution. So that's the library's rationale for Nora's being here today, and we're all most grateful. Th thanks very much. And, and I want to thank Mary Jean Creek and um, basically for that wonderful introduction, but also for ma the many things that he's, she's done, and I'll come into it, but I also do want to thank uh, Dr. Pfaff because uh, he actually, the way that he convinced me, because my life is, uh, has an administrative component and a scientific one, and I don't need more tasks. And he says, Nora, would you co-edit this with me? And the way that he convinced me was, this will be made available for all of those countries that cannot afford it. And me coming from Mexico, I actually recognize all of the limitations that we have. And I think it is quite extraordinary that, done, that you've done this, that you bring actually the opportunity of bringing knowledge uh, to those that otherwise wouldn't have it. And I think that hopefully others would get inspired by this generosity and similar projects would emerge in other areas of, of science and health. I think ultimately it's quite remarkable. But now I'm going to jump. And he had asked me, Nora, speak about addiction. And I thought that I was going to actually be speaking in terms of a general audience. So what I prepare is a general talk. But I'm going to emphasize uh, in these general terms what are some of the extraordinary opportunities that we have and some of the challenges. And in this space, uh, it behooves me to actually, uh, for all of you that may not know, uh, recognize the important role that Mary Jean Creek and Paul Greengard, both of them, have had into the field of neurosciences. And if it were not for their work, uh, we would be much further behind in terms of understanding that neuroplasticity changes, how is it that the brain changes when repeatedly exposed to a stimuli, what is the molecular machinery on the one hand, which Paul, Gray, uh, Paul has helped us illuminate in a very detailed way. Way. And in the other one, the notion of bringing knowledge that ultimately can influence the treatment of individuals addicted to, to opioid in this case, which is right now, as you know, the major crisis that we're facing in the country uh, in health, by far. There's no comparison. And I was commenting to Paul that the unofficial data for 2016 in terms of people dying from opioids is actually estimated at 66,000 in 2016, which is much higher than fatalities from car accidents, much higher than the number of fatalities that we have at the peak of the HIV epidemic. And in that context, one of the most powerful tools that we have are the treatment for addiction, for opioid addiction, of which methadone, actually, I would sort of say Mary Jean is the mother of methadone. <laughs> and so that, that has been a game changer. And I wish we had a similar medication for other addictions, but we don't. But we are fortunate to have it at least for, um, for opioid addiction. And this is one of the strategies that we're following is how do we expand access to this life-saving medication to all of those people that without it are, have the, the risk actually of not making it is very, very high. So I do want you to all be aware of how important the work of, of two of uh, the scientists that are stuck here today in the whole field of addiction. Now, I, I've been very much uh, actually uh, using, and I'm going to illustrate the whole, the whole narrative of addiction of where we are, what are the elements that we're looking to on the basis of imaging. And I use imaging because I like to actually use technologies that I know very well, but this actually applies not just for imaging, but it actually, imaging, the beauty of imaging is it allows us to investigate things directly in the human brain. 
Well, one of the things that it has become, and you've heard it say, addiction is a disease of the brain, and we all in the science world say it, but unfortunately this has not been actually integrated into the way that we practice medicine, and very few um, uh, physicians or uh, physician providers or healthcare systems actually are engaged in the screening and treatment of addiction. Now, what has enabled us to determine that in fact addiction is a disease is the access to imaging technologies that allow us to look inside the human brain. And in, in so doing, it allows us to do what the other physicians have done for all their specialties. And this is illustrated in this case for um, brain technology, positron emission tomography, that allows you to look at the consumption of glucose by the tissue. And when tissues are very active, it's the main source of energy. So this is a normal heart, and you see the muscle in, this is the, the con concentration implying high, high utilization of glucose, high metabolism. And this is a patient that suffered a myocardial infarct. And you can see the decrease in the consumption of glucose of this part of the myocardium. So this illustrates, yes, it's a disease of the heart. Nobody would question it. But it also allows us to pinpoint exactly where the defect is. And that, in turn, guides the, the cardiologists of where they are going to do their surgical intervention if, in that, indeed, this uh, tissue is presumed to be still able to respond. If it's dead, then a surgical intervention to, to uh, bring flow in there is not going to work. But now we can use this same technology to apply it for the human brain, and you can actually identify the areas of the brain where there may be deficits in function. And when you apply it to individuals that are addicted to drugs, there are actually, of course, there's tremendous variability in the pattern of pathology, like you can have it for myocardial infarcts. But there's also certain consistent findings that have emerged throughout the past 25 years of studying on imaging on people that are addicted that identify that one of the main areas that's consistently disrupted in people that are addicted is the frontal cortex. And most notable, the lower part, the ventral part of the frontal cortex that we refer to as orbital frontal cortex. So with this technology, can we not only identify that, yes, there is a dysfunction of the tissue, just like we do for heart disease, but by understanding what is the function of, the, of this particular area, uh, what are the processes that are actually um, um, ultimately um, resolved by these, by these regions and with, in partnership with what uh, other areas? Because what we now know, of course, is that brain is a complex set of networks. So one region does not act in isolation, is massively connected. And this uh, it's again, the notion of networks interacting with one another that allows us to explain function. But this area, the orbital frontal cortex, is fundamental for us to assign saliency value, and importantly, saliency value that can be changed as a function of our needs. So if I'm thirsty, water is very salient to me, but the moment I drink it, it's no longer salient, and it's the orbital frontal cortex sending that message that allows me then to change my interest from water into something else. If you damage this area of the brain, then you lose that flexibility. And then your behavior becomes perseverative and you cannot degrade the value of that particular water. And so this is exactly, you start to get a, an understanding about addiction. In the moment that this area of the brain that assigns value becomes fixated, it loses its ability to adapt to the environment, then you can see why in people that are addicted to drugs, they can actually not stop taking them, even though, and as many of them say, Drugs are no longer pleasurable for many of them. They'll tell you, I don't know why I'm taking it. It's no longer pleasurable. I just cannot stop it. So again, highlighting how uh, something that a priori we would have not identified is actually extraordinarily important. We also know a lot about why is it that drugs produce addiction, and, and Paul Gringer's work has been very instrumental in this. And in, in predominantly, all of the drugs of abuse, whether it's legal or illegal, they don't make a distinction, actually have something in common. How they do it is very different. But all of them actually increase dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. And the nucleus accumbens is the main reward center in the brain. And we know when, that when dopamine is increased in this center at very high concentrations and very abruptly, that is highly reinforcing. And it generates a memory. And, and you generate memories in ways actually that are similar to the way that you have studied memory, the formation of neuroplastic changes, uh, basically strengthening of um, glutamatergic synapses. And this is uh, the increases in dopamine, though, is what to start with is associated with reward. 
this, this system is actually uh, has evolved over millions of years of evolution and is something that has been preserved in organisms of tremendous simplicity to the most complex one like the human brain. And it's a very clever one because it actually, the ability of feeling, uh, of increasing dopamine and perceiving that rewarding effect actually is the way that biology um, actually is incites us to repeat behaviors that are crucial for survival. And that's why eating is pleasurable, because if, we, if it were not ple pleasurable or rewarding, we wouldn't go to the extreme behavioral needs that we may have had to do when we were primitive men out there in, in the desert or in the jungle trying to get food. So you need to have a very strong incentive, and that incentive is brought by dopamine. The beauty about dopamine is that it's not just the sense that it produces this reward, but it, when it's activated, like sex is another one that, of course, is very important for the survival of the species. If it were not reinforcing, we wouldn't survive, we wouldn't pro, uh, uh, pro procreate. But when this is actually, these dopaminergic responses occur at, uh, at high levels, you actually generate a memory. You get conditioned to that stimuli. And this can happen very rapidly upon one exposure. And again, the molecular mechanisms are actually some of the most fascinating and, um, findings that we've had in the whole field because we have been able to actually identify which receptors and, um, and, how, and what is the temporal sequence of those changes. So this is drugs, this is methamphetamine, changes in dopamine microdialysis. You can do this with voltammetry, which gives you a much better temporal resolution. But these were the first studies, and this is sex, and you can immediately see the uh, efficacy of drugs to produce these increases in dopamine, activate the system that conditions you, and then that conditioning drives the behavior. That conditioning will drive the behavior, and this is key to understand. Um, it's more, po more potent with drugs than with natural reinforcers. And this is actually believed to explain why um, when drugs stimulate the system that's there, and we use it every single day or constantly, uh, in, it can tr trigger neuroplastic changes much faster than natural reinforcers because this is a supraphysiological stimulation. This is time. Uh, this is actually minutes. minutes. Yeah, and this is actually minutes. And the other, so, so that's what we know very, very now, and this has been brought up for studies on preclinical, um, most of them initially on rodents, but also in non-human primates. But we also, that, that why dopamine is fundamental, but we also know something that too has been an area that's fascinating and it's expanding, that addiction is a disease that is de developmentally linked that the risk for addiction are much greater when you get exposed to drugs as a teenager or as a child than if you get exposed to them as an adult. And there are many factors that account for these differences, and of course, understanding why is very, very relevant. But, um, and this just shows the, the age at which you are much more likely to get a diagnosis for this case of a cannabis use disorder, and you can see age 18, 23, but, but after 25, your likelihood is actually much lower. And just identifying a period of vulnerability. It's an interesting phenomenon because this is a period of vulnerability also for all of the psychiatric diseases. And they emerge, whether it is depression, autism emerges very, very early on, but whether it is depression or schizophrenia or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, they are starting to see the symptoms in childhood and adolescence. And so the question is, why is that so? And one of the reasons why that is so is that the brain actually is developing during those stages, and our brain will not be fully developed until we are in our mid-20s. There are many, many changes that had happened to that process, and if you were to ask me, because I, I sort of actually you can get lost in terms of uh, the, the, the specifics, I would like to say the following in terms of the development of the brain, and again, I'm making a simplification. But the brain is designed for us to respond to an environment and to adapt to it and to predict it, to optimally work on it. So in order to have that characteristics that will allow it to be most efficient, you have to get it a chance to get exposed to environment while it is developing. And that's why the developmental stage is so long. 
So the brain is born with many more neurons than the ones that it will end up having as an adult. And I like to think of it as a sculpture. So you have the sculpture and you have the big stone which has much more volume than the ultimate sculpture that would end up of it. Just so you start to remove the pieces and the brain starts to mold itself in terms of what it's actually environmental stimuli are occurring and also in terms of its genetic imprinting. And this is highly orchestrated between your genetics and your environmental exposures. So you start to lose neurons, but you also start to form connections and you form these extraordinary complex networks. So as we go into our 20s, you can see a massive increase in the connectivity of the brain. And these connections uh, that are forming the networks do not develop at the same timeline. Some of them develop very, very early. For example, the collectivity of the limbic brain, of the somatosensory systems, occur very, very rapidly. Whereas the connectivity of the prefrontal cortex is one of the last ones to develop. And as a result of that, the prefrontal cortex, which is also one of the most uh, uh, the late, later phase uh, development of the brain in terms of uh, species, species development, is um, fundamental for our capacity to exert um, cognitive control, to modulate our emotions, to do uh, reasoning and judgment. And, and the prefrontal cortex is massively connected with the limbic brain, and this is a bilateral connection. And this connection does not form until you are actually in your, as I mentioned, until your mid-20s. And the consequence of this is that the prefrontal cortex, if it's not connected with the limbic brain, it's, it cannot regulate it. And this is predominantly a glutamatergic connection and you can actually regulate the activity of these brain regions. And now researchers, for example, have shown with using magnetic resonance imaging, and which you can use to actually look at the structure of the uh, water, water, white matter tracks by basically looking at the movement of water because when you have a white matter track, you can monitor with the MRI the directionality of that water and the intensity of the signal can then be uh, used as a measure of the thickness of that particular track. And this is a track that pertains to the connection of the prefrontal cortical regions with more subcortical areas including limbic brain. And what these researchers, for example, using this type of strategies have been able to show is that the greater the connections, the better the self-control. And the, the lower the connectivity, the, the worse your ability to actually ex, uh, exert um, inhibition. So this is a task that it requires your ability to stop a prepotent response. And you, of course, improve as you grow older and as your prefrontal cortex gets actually uh, strengthened. Now, we have always been very intrigued in terms of uh, understanding, well, why is there so much variability among individuals in terms of these connectivity patterns? And this is a very relevant one because it helps us understand why some individuals as adolescents may be at much higher risks of impulsive behaviors. And this, this uh, per performance in this task is associated with much more impulsivity. And adolescents are worse and they are more impulsive. And so the, what is it that drives it? And there are many factors, and obviously, that, that actually generate the differences between all of us in terms of the, the efficacy of that connectivity. Uh, but one of them is exposure to drugs. And so, for example, we now know, and this is very relevant, because it's in the domain of uh, our policy, that uh, individuals that get exposed to drugs during childhood or adolescence, uh, whether it is alcohol or, in this case, uh, cannabis, marijuana, they actually, that in and of itself, those exposures can delay the formation of these connections of the cortical areas with limbic areas. And these are areas, these are images also using diffusion, diffusion tensor imaging, which is the technology I just mentioned to look at tracks that identify the differences in connectivity strength in individuals that as adolescents have consumed high quantities of cannabis versus those that did not. And the areas in colors are actually those tracks where there were significant differences between the both groups. And what's notable about this finding was that actually, even though it's not a prospective study, which is something that we're currently doing, because that's ultimately the experimental design that will uh, unequivocally be able to control for a lot of the variables. 
What is notable is that the strength of the connectivity is actually 80% lower in those individuals that consume cannabis that in control in certain key pathways, including this one, for example, that is connected to the hippocampus. And again, the hippocampal prefrontal pathway is one of the ones that is linked with our capacity, again, to be able to regulate very, very strong emotions. This is another very interesting connectivity path that's uh, disrupted by, by early exposure with marijuana. And it's important because this area of the brain, we call it the precunius. And the precunius had not, uh, nobody had paid much attention to it until researchers started to find out that this is one of the first areas that is actually uh, shows dysfunction in individuals suffering from Alzheimer's disease very, very early on. This happens to be one of the most connected areas of the brain. And so it acts like a major hub that is processing information back and forth. And so you can start to recognize that if this is disrupted, your capacity to actually operate at multiple levels may be um, disrupted. So based on findings like this one, we are now conducting a study where we are funding at, the, at NIDA to follow 10,000 children ages eight to nine, uh, periodically with brain imaging as they transition into adulthood. So we can understand prospectively how do drugs influence those pathways of uh, uh, brain development that are also likely to vary between all of us. And such a study will also allow us to understand what is the normal variability of an individual's brain development. The other element that it, there's also significant evidence both from preclinical studies as well as from imaging studies, whether it is positron emission tomography or with MRI, is that the exposure of drugs significantly changes the brain. And my first slide show how it interferes with the function of the orbital frontal cortex as well as other prefrontal areas of the brain. But we can also use imaging to actually look at receptors and en enzymes and inquire how do exposure to drugs influence uh, these, these proteins, which of course are very important for signaling neurotransmitter functions. And neurotransmitters are fundamental for how the brain communicates, obviously. We, we said that to start with, we know that we can look at dopamine because dopamine is the molecule, is the neurotransmitter that it, all of the drugs uh, increase in order to produce addiction and reward. But, uh, but they do it differently. And in this case, what I'm just showing you is how cocaine does it. Cocaine um, binds to the dopamine transporter, which is in the dopamine terminal, the dopamine cells that produce dopamine. Normally, dopamine is released, and it's immediately recycled back to this transporter. And this fast recycling is terminates its action. It's a very, very dynamic process. If you block this recycling, you accumulate dopamine, and that produces the pleasure reward with cocaine. Other drugs do it differently, but this is the way that cocaine does it. So a question that has emerged is this is what any one of us will get if they were to give us cocaine. We will all have increases in dopamine, and it will be very rewarding. But that does not explain addiction, because in addiction, you, in a person, basically, it will have also these increases in dopamine, but the response is basically categorically different. If I'm given cocaine, and I've never been given, but I can make this imaginary experiment in my brain, I'm given cocaine, dopamine goes up, I feel great. Oh. And then, but that's it, I don't want any more. If I'm addicted to it, it will immediately trigger this compulsion to want to get more. And that distinction, and lead me to escalate and not be able to stop it. And that's exactly what addiction is. So what is, how does this system, dopamine, get influenced by, uh, in, how is it affected, or does it play a role in the process of addiction? So basically, on basis on, on preclinical studies, I mean, obviously, one could, could say we are stimulating, and we know that uh, this system, from studies that have been done with stimulant drugs, as well as neuroleptics that block it, that if you overstimulate these receptors, this is the case of dopamine D2 receptors, um, they downregulate in animal models. And if you block them with drugs like antipsychotics, they upregulate. So we ask the question, does that happen in people that are addicted? And using imaging, then you can take this, uh, actually inquire inside and see if there are changes in the expression of the dopamine D2 receptors. And we have shown for many, many years now and repeated it, and many others have replicated that that a consistent finding in addiction is that there is a down-regulation of the expression of dopamine D2 receptors. 
And this is a very interesting finding because in the striatum, and that includes the nucleus, nucleus accumbens, but also the dorsal striatum. When these studies were emerging, what was unclear is why, what is its importance? And now, of course, we have learned uh, a lot about the importance of these receptors. But the first, the first thought that one would want to say is, uh, and again, this is the, one of the limitations of imaging in humans, is that you cannot manipulate the system. So you can have an observational find, finding that is rep reproducible and you can reproduce it, but what you want to address at is the question, how does that relate to the process of addiction? How does this downregulation actually influence addiction? And that is very difficult to manipulate in humans. So again, an example about why translating from humans to animals is as important as translating from animals to humans. So in this case, for example, the question would be, if low levels of receptors is linked with your vulnerability to, to take and escalate drug taking and be compulsive in drug taking, then it means that if I increase these receptors, I should be able to contain that behavior, to counteract it. And you can do that, of course, in animals. There you can manipulate it. And so this is uh, the first study that we did. We replicated this in two different um, rodents, uh, alcohol preferring, alcohol not preferring. This is uh, Spragdolis for alcohol. And we've replicated it for, um, for cocaine. And using a completely different strategy, Eric uh, Nessler has also been able to basically show what I'm going to show here. And that is, first of all, the way that we did it was just following the logic of what we had seen in the experiments before, that uh, if animals, if we were able to increase the levels of dopamine D2 receptors, would we be able to prevent the escalation of drug taking? And this first study, which we did many, many years ago, was we made these Pragdoli rats uh, basically administer high quantities of alcohol, and when they were administering them, we stereotactically inject them with adenovirus, inside was a D2 receptor gene, this raises the D2 receptors, and um, adenovirus don't sustain, and we try to work with other viruses. We have not been successful. So we are limited to working with a temporal expression, overexpression of the, the receptors. It goes back to baseline at the, again, day 10. But we all, we all actually can repeat the injections, and then the receptors go back. And then in that concept, you can ask the question, in this case, what happens to alcohol drinking? And it's the same whether it is pragdolis or uh, alcohol preferring, or it is cocaine. When you increase receptors in the striatum, you markedly attenuate the doses of drug that the animal is consuming. So in this case, it's reduced by 70%. So when you have the highest levels of expression of D2 receptors, you have the, ma the, ma the greatest decrease in consumption. And then as receptors go back to baseline, you go back to baseline levels. You inject again, and drinking goes back down, and this is just animals injected with the adenovirus uh, with no gene to just control for non-specific effects. Indicating indeed that if you enhance D2 receptors, and what Eric has shown is if you enhance the efficacy of those D2 receptors, the signaling mechanism, you actually oppose the administration of high quantities of drugs. You, you counteract the rewarding effects of drugs as it relates to the propensity to consume them. And then this gives us uh, basically an insight and an insight that you can go both ways. If you have low levels of dopamine D2 receptors, and now we know from work that had been done in the whole, particularly in Parkinson's disease, where the, the studies have actually allowed us to, to, to um, identify the striatocortical circuit that signals through the dopamine D2 receptor, which is an indirect striatocortical pathway, which contrasts with a direct pathway mediated by D1 receptors. And the D2 receptor system in the motor system is fundamental for counteracting the Go motor system. And the involvement of those systems is optimal mode movement. Because if I move, I need to inhibit that one portion. And if those systems are not working with one another, then you actually, if you don't have that signaling uh, from the D2 receptor system that actually will inhibit the indirect pathway, you are frozen. You cannot actually initiate movement. But, but with the reward system, something more complex than in the dorsal striatum occurs, but also um, in the same line, D1, direct, drives reward, D2, receptor system, controls it. And so what we now know is that uh, decreases in D2 receptors 
are interfering with the signaling of that indirect pathway that will allow to modulate those responses. The question is how does it do it? And again, these, uh, these uh, um, data showing that if you enhance D2 receptor signaling, whichever method you use, this, this one with gene therapy or, or manipulation of the protein itself, you actually interfere with com consumption of drugs. In contrast, if you actually enhance D2 receptor system, uh, the, if you enhance that D2 receptor system, you interfere with the consumption of drugs. But if you enhance that D1 receptor system, you basically facilitate the compulsive use of drugs. So you have a counter a balancing effect of these two uh, dopaminergic systems, D1 and D2. And we've been very curious to know why. How does the brain do that? Because obviously the striatum is a subcortical region that signals to the cortex, right? I mean, it's not in isolation. And this, again, our findings both on ventral and dorsal striatum that we're observing. So what is the consequence? And in terms of how the brain functions when this striatal indirect system does not work. And we've been studying, again, for many uh, years we've used this strategy. Now we're actually in parallel doing studies with the fMRI to look at how that influences the activation responses. To look at how the levels of dopamine D2 receptors in the striatum, which are decreasing in multiple types of addictions, ultimately influence the function of the brain. And what you see is that the lower the levels of dopamine D2 receptors, the lower the activity in frontal areas. And that is, I'm identifying here the orbital frontal cortex. These are people that are addicted to cocaine. These are people that are addicted to alcohol. And this is the regions where low levels of dopamine D2 receptors in the, in the striatum is associated with decreased activity. And this is the medial part of the orbital frontal cortex. So it's a, it's a very consistent finding that we see in people that are addicted or individuals at very high risk of addiction. Uh, that the reduction on D2 receptors is translating into a decreased activity of prefrontal areas which are fundamental for our capacity to exert self-regulation and self-control. And if you follow the pathway, and I don't have time to do that, you can see why decreases in D2 receptors will result in actually decreased activity in prefrontal areas at baseline. But this is well and done uh, in terms of how these changes are happening, but it does not illuminate or illustrate or give an answer about what we've known all along. We do know that drugs affect the brain, and we're starting to delineate those changes that can result in the loss of control and compulsive administration. We know that uh, biology development, the younger you start, the worse off, the greater the risk of becoming addicted. We know that genes are fundamental. We know that uh, addiction runs in family. And people like to put numbers, and I love numbers, so I am going to use numbers. But it's, again, I don't know what the errors of that number is. But if I say 50% of your vulnerability is uh, related to uh, your genes, I am not saying something that's completely out there uh, absolutely exaggerated or too conservative. And it is a, it's, a, it's a more or less a good estimate um, that we do have a genetic vulnerability. But we also know that the environment is fundamental. And one of the, the areas that is now obvious, but when we started with the whole world of genetics, it was not, we had this sense that a gene will explain um, the association with disease. And now we're finding that we need a multiplicity of genes in order to explain a very relatively small percentage of the variance. And what's happening is we're starting to understand that the reason why we cannot explain more variance is that the way that the genes are influencing disease, in this case addiction, is by their interactions with the environment. And so the area that now is fascinating is how do genes actually influence our responses to the environment, including drugs, and how genes influences our brain development and therefore our vulnerability for drugs. So this is a space. But in the field of environment, actually, I think that one of the areas that is, uh, again, has been possible to start uh, investigating because of advances in tools and technologies in animal models and imaging is what does the environment do to our brain, particularly during that developmental stage? And I said this very long, 25 years, and it starts actually during fetal development. So uh, the brain is plastic, and it's uh, designed as an organ to maximize, actually, its function on the basis of its environment. So if you are in an adverse environment where you are socially deprived, where you are socially stressed, um, 
what does that do to the brain? And, and now studies are starting to emerge and we also can start to look at how do adverse environments influence these proteins, that dopamine D2 receptors, that is fundamental for our capacity to actually ensure that that striatocortical pathway indirect will pro provide proper modulation of prefrontal areas of the brain. And this, area, this study, for example, from Michael Nader, is a beautiful study that actually illustrated that, and I don't think anyone has been able to come up with a more elegant way of showing it because of all of its implications. I mean, these are non-human primates. They're measuring dopamine D2 receptors, this protein I was mentioning before that is decreasing people that are addicted, that when you increase it in animals, it actually reduces compulsive use of drugs. And um, these animals, they studied them in isolation. Extraordinarily stressful for a non-human primate. So these animals were housed in isolation or throughout all of their development. Then they take them into a house environment, multiple animals into one cage, and allowed for the hierarchical structure to form. Then they scan them again to measure dopamine D2 receptors. And what they found is quite interesting. Those individuals that when uh, they are housed in a group and become dominant, upregulate D2 receptors. Those individuals that actually uh, are um, subordinates do not change the two receptors in which in these animals remain very, very, very low. And when, long and behold, when they then put them into a, a laboratory to see how much they administer, these animals in green, basically these are doses of cocaine, don't administer much cocaine at all. These ones rapidly administer high, high concentrations. And again, highlighting how uh, experiments like this one can give us an insight about why a socially adverse environment, which is one of the mo most consistent factors associated with greater risk for addiction, may be increasing the risk for addiction. And I use this slide actually to actually address the concept of how do we treat as a nation our uh, addicted people? We criminalize them. And we criminalize young people and we send them to prison or to jail. And I cannot think anything that can be more stressful to the brain of a person that is thrown into jail. Well, if this is predictive of what happens in the human brain, we can actually determine that not only is it not effective on uh, containing the drug use, it's actually uh, making it much worse. This is another beautiful example of work that has emerged uh, very much with MRI that has been looking at the differences in brain development, particularly at the connectivity of the brain of individuals that have been born up in deprived uh, conditions like in, in orphanages. And in this case, because it's actually ultimately neglect. And what the data is showing is that one of the worst things that you can do at a developing brain is to isolate an individual, to not give it, as it's growing up, the diversity of the human social contacts. That produces a marked change in the delay of the connectivity of the, of the, of the cortical regions. And this actually shows one of those studies, is um, measuring the duration of time in orphanages versus the, the, the density uh, as assessed with functional anisotropy, which is this measure of water movement in, for one of uh, the connections, the uncinate fasciculus, which is the one that we have here. And we can see that uh, the, con the longer they have been in the orphanages, the, um, the, the less um, developed this, this path is, whereas shorter periods of time are associated with much better connectivity. And, and stories like this one, you say, well, what do you take it and why is this important? And it is important because what now investigators are starting to look at is if you take these individuals that have this type of development and you do an intervention to try to actually compensate, you can actually accelerate the recovery of the brain. So now we have the means to actually evaluate the extent to which prevention interventions can help remediate some of the adverse effects of an environment that may put a person into a much greater risk, not just for of addiction, but certainly of other mental illnesses. And we take this and we've been doing actually, of course, research of an important area for us on the field is what is it that we can do to prevent addiction? I mean, and whenever we can prevent a disease, we actually can have a much greater impact than when we treat it. And just from studies based on the epidemiological work and behavioral interventions, we know that the, those prevention interventions that afford different entries that go from identifying factors that are making an individual vulnerable to addiction, like um, poor connectivity of the prefrontal cortex or poor socialization 
or poor impulse control, you can intervene to strengthen them. Lack of parental supervision is probably one of the, the most frequently associated factors with higher risk. Uh, but the community, the school system in which they are, and certainly poverty. And what's fascinating with the world of neuroscience is that these, these elements that we have identified, that we all know that they, we need to reduce in order to actually protect someone, while at the same time increase all of those that give you protective and resilience, we can now study them so that we can tailor interventions that are much more likely to be effective. We also know, too, that in terms of addiction, addiction can be treated. And I started by saying the important work that Marie-Jean had done with respect to the methadone. And I'm illustrating it to here because it's not just that you can get a person to stop taking drugs and to be able to recover. I want to say that uh, the changes that um, have been reported in, in animals and in humans from exposure to drugs are very long lasting. And they persist months or years after the person stops taking the drug. And this has led us to the concept that addiction is a chronic disease. So when we're dealing with treatment, unfortunately, we cannot deal with an intervention like an antibiotic where I can cure someone. I can treat them just like I treat that diabetes or hypertension. I can regulate the symptoms. And what we are aiming is, of course, how can we in the future start to accelerate that recovery so that one day we may be able to completely treat them. But the brain, and, and there the brain guides us because we can actually use some of the parameters that we identify that are affected by drugs. For example, methamphetamine is particularly toxic to the dopamine terminals. And these are images uh, uh, averaging in a group of subjects, 20 controls and 20 methamphetamine abusers, at different planes of the basal ganglia where you can actually see the dopamine transporters that serve as a marker of the terminals. And you can see in a methamphetamine abusers, these are the average images, significantly reduced. But when you take these individuals and you put them to treatment and nine months later, you actually measure the, how the expression of this protein that, that serves as a marker of dopamine terminals, you can see a significant recovery. And, and, and highlighting the notion that not just can you be able to recover from taking drugs, but that we can actually uh, help the brain recover so that uh, ultimately, hopefully, that they can regain uh, sobriety. What I do, I show this slide just to identify the concept that these changes are long lasting and uh, we need to actually, and this is data from, um, I mean, a, a concept very elo eloquently described by Tom McClellan and showing how um, we need to, to treat uh, any, any other medical disease, addiction like any other medical disease and not have these magical expectations that you send someone to treatment for one month, and once they leave the treatment program, they are basically, they are expected to go back to normal. And so the same thing with, with an IBT hypertensive, you stop the antihypertensive and blood pressure will go up. I mean, it's a non-brainer. The same thing with drug addiction, you stop the treatment and the addicted person will relapse. But this is not the way, of course, that our uh, culture or our society looks at it, and we've created very false expectations. And again, this is one of the aspects that we need to address in order to improve the outcomes and the acceptability of treatments such as methadone. And my final slide is this one. I mean, we are, I started by saying we're facing probably the worst crisis by far we've ever faced in the addiction world uh, in terms of the consequences. And 64,000 people dying of overdoses is just part of the whole story. There are many others that are dying from complications associated with infectious diseases or for, from cancer or from accidents. We don't actually know the total estimate of the consequences of this crisis. We know that it's affecting neonates and neonatal abstinence syndrome is going way, way up. And I was in, one, in, in a meeting in the Vatican because the Vatican called in a meeting to try to understand what was going on in the United States. And there was this surgeon from uh, Harvard and he said something that just left me uh, completely disturbed. And he stood up and he said, you know, for the first time, we don't have any, any need of organs. For the first time, we have sufficient organs for transplants. I mean, it's a horrific, I mean, it's, it's horrific in terms of what it is basically meaning. There are so many people that are dying that actually they don't longer have a problem with, with getting organs. And I think that that just, whichever way that you look at the statistics, 
they are horrific and actually difficult to, to actually conceptualize. So how, what do we do? And I think that in my perspective is we need to change the culture of the healthcare system so that it just not stays like that. Yes, we know that addiction is a disease, but it's, I don't treat it. Let someone else deal with it. The healthcare system has to change in such a way that it becomes part of the screening and the intervention and the prevention of substance use disorders. Because what we are living right now in terms of the opioid crisis is a function of that indifference of the healthcare system and the stigma that it has led on that has actually justified its complete uh, indifference to the medical care of these individuals. And so you just see right now, ultimately, what a very small percentage of individuals with a substance use disorder in general are being treated. Very small percentage are being treated with evidence-based and even a smaller percentage are, are being treated within the healthcare system. And this is something that through science, through the development of medications, that's probably the most important thing that we can do in order to change this culture. And it is this changing culture that we need to do in order to address the opioid crisis, but also to prevent it from ever happening again. Thanks very much. Well, I, I completely agree with you, Mary Jean, and I think that the crisis is such that I, with this, um, I think that um, President Trump is actually preparing to call it a national emergency sometime, hopefully next week. I do not know the details, but uh, if that is the case, they, they can actually make it obligatory. We have been trying to go to the medical examiners that actually prepare the questions because then the medical schools would pay attention. I do predict, I do not know, but I would predict that the Chris Christie committee will uh, de declare that as one of the recommendations. And it's not just about medical students, it's also about nurses, it's also about pharmacists, it's about dentists. Actually, everybody that is in the healthcare system to be able to recognize substance use disorders and treat them. And the statement at the same time that we need to also improve the quality of, of education and training for management of pain and prescription of opioid uh, medications because that's also very, very poorly, uh, uh, students are very poorly trained and they don't know how to use them, they just use them. Well, and you're, you're thinking about the use of uh, methadone or buprenorphine as analgesics. And actually, it was interesting because this was a comment that Marijin gave to me at one point that methadone was actually quite effective as an analgesic drug and buprenorphine is extensively used as an analgesic compound in Europe, not in the United States. I actually, because they are, there haven't been, I mean, the problem that we face in, in the world of management and the pharmacology of pain is that there have been very few clinical studies that have evaluated the efficacy of opioid medications, or for that matter, non-opioid medications, for chronic pain. And when actually we assign uh, to do a, a, a detailed study of what the status of the field was, there was only one study that was identified that had evaluated the effects of opioids in the management of pain for more than six months, one clinical study. So there's no sufficient data, and without it, I cannot actually comment in terms of how should we look at or view a drug like methadone for the management of chronic pain. And I'm, I'm at this time just focusing on chronic pain because management of acute pain is not a question right now. I mean, it's important because we're over prescribing, but the management of acute pain is something that we need to do. We know how to do much better. There's a lot of literature there. Chronic pain, very little. And very little also uh, on what is it that leads to the transition from acute to chronic pain. Why is it with the same condition when the insult is no longer there, some people continue to have pain, whereas others do not? And understanding that, of course, is very relevant because it, if you know it, you can prevent it. So I, can, I think there was a question. Of, yeah, no, and we've been very interested. I mean, certainly, I mean, drugs are stimulating this pathway, but there are many other stimulant reinforcers that we get exposed to that stimulate it. And, and as I show you, the physiological stimulation with drugs is much greater than, than food or sex. But what's happening is that we're manufacturing certain foods that have unique qualities that can actually trigger a much more potent response. 
And uh, Kravitz, for example, at the NIDDK intramural program at the NIH has actually shown that uh, exposure in animal models of these obesogenic uh, foods leads to a down-regulation of the dopamine D2 receptors. And also he has shown that that in parallel is, is associated with a decrease in spontaneous locomotor activity. So then you have a mechanism that contributes. And we have been doing imaging studies in, in animals, in rats that are obese, and in humans that are morbidly obese, and also have shown a down-regulation of the D2 receptor system in the striatum. So that is one of the common elements that is associated also with disrupt dysfunction of prefrontal area. So it's not a unique, I mean, it, we are tapping into a neurotransmitter system, into a circuit that is fundamental in driving and motivating actions. So, and, and the question that always uh, brings up is, what about other types of reinforcers, right? So now we have kids exposed to video gaming and in certain countries where the compulsive video gaming is so bad that they stop eating. And some of them have actually died from, from collapse, from just compulsive, compulsive behaviors and they are developing treatment. So the, the, we are a genius in manipulating that system. I mean, if you want to sell something, you can actually, if you can generate the activation of this pathway, if you can condition the individual in such a way that you can create this preferential um, value of this reinforcer, then you will have it uh, basically get priority over everything else. No, I didn't say that, no. I basically don't think that the criminalizing of marijuana is a good idea at all. I know, the criminalize, two things. I'm not, what I'm not for is I'm not pro-legalization. I think that legalization of marijuana will bring us a third legal drug. And legal drugs uh, actually account for much more morbidity and mortality because it increases the likelihood that you would get exposed to them and you would get exposed to them repeatedly. But I am against criminalization of people that are using drugs. I don't think that it actually helps anyone who has a problem with a substance use disorder to be sent to jail or to prison to deal with the problem because it actually will uh, act negatively in terms of their own um, neurocircuitry. It will, by imposing them into a very stressful environment, you're actually going to do them a disfavor on their capacity to adapt. What you want to do is to create a system that can give them the resilience that they don't have. You want to be able to buffer those deficits. So that's why I'm against, I'm against criminalizing. It's a disease. I mean, when do we put someone suffering from a disease in jail or in prison? It makes no sense, not scientific, not morally, not at any level whatsoever. No, no, there are two things, and we tend to confuse them. One is legalizing, and the other is decriminalizing. And the legalization, where I basically, when you legalize a drug, you create the possibility of a market that is going to be making revenues on their success of selling a product that has addictive properties. So the more you get people to get into your product, and the more they get addicted, the more you make money. And that was the problem that we faced with tobacco and alcohol. That's why I'm against the concept of legalization. That's, that's a concept that I'm against. But if someone is addicted to drugs, basically, my message and what the, the, the evidence shows is you need to do a therapeutic intervention. And that therapeutic intervention should be constrained within the concept of a chronic model of disease. No, in animals, we, uh, I mean, a lot of people have different strategies. Yeah, no, the question is, uh, are, is there anything in humans that we can do, any technology that we could do to actually enhance the expression of dopamine D2 receptors? I, I was hoping that as we started to develop drugs that can manipulate epigenetic marks, we may be, a, we may, would be able to actually increase the expression of the two receptors, the transcription and the translation of the receptors. But as of now, there's nothing that has emerged in those, in those sites. So uh, there, there is, uh, I mean, what people are starting to think, of course, is the notion of aspects that we wouldn't dare to do in the past. For example, if you, um, I mean, can you do insertion of genes in a particular area of the brain? Can you use cells 
to deliver um, cell therapies that you would actually be able to deliver uh, signals that you want to transmit it. But it is um, nothing that I have actually seen even in a protocol that approaches it in humans. I mean, with optogenetic stimulation, it's like one of the things that you could actually specifically stimulate the indirect pathway, and you could actually then even do it at the frequencies that you want. But that would require that you would uh, express those uh, channel, rhodo channel rhodopsin into, into the human brain. And there are people that are starting to think of that, um, but I do not know of any, any protocol, nor do I know of any grantee that has come and been successful in our institute in getting the grant. Yes. Yeah. No, but what happens is that when you start to get very high doses of cocaine, it becomes aversive. There's a dose range at which you get really very robust administration. So that's how you explain. And you can see that it's always an inverted U shape. And, and uh, what happens is these people, these animals that were um, the dominance, if you gave them very tiny doses of cocaine, very, very small doses, then they would take it. But they were extremely sensitive to the doses that the others were taking. And we've seen that in humans also, actually. We can understand the sensitivity to uh, the same dose of the stimulant being aversive for some and pleasurable to others on the, on the basis of how many of those receptors are expressed. Because, because one of the things is, uh, Paul, yeah, no, I'm going to repeat it. I want, uh, uh, the question has to do with the question if, if we develop a drug that can interfere with your addiction, why would a person take it uh, if they want to still uh, stay in the state on the addiction? And let me, let me divide it into points. One of them is uh, people that are addicted to drugs may want, uh, particularly at the beginning when they still feel the pleasure of the drug, may still want to be able to get high. Once they become addicted, no one wants to be addicted because it is it's the loss of control. And at that stage, they are actually taking the drug actually to feel better, they, that, that you get tolerant to those effects. So, and there are opportunities to work with. For example, naloxone is used in Europe for individuals that are heavy alcohol drinkers that want to be able to go into a bar, but they don't want to lose control. So they don't want to binge. So they take naloxone before they actually go into the bar, and that contains the craving. So they can still drink, but it actually decreases that constant urge of more and more the binging. And so if we could do that, and this is, has been one of, of my arguments with the FDA, because the FDA is demanding that we demonstrate that there's complete abstinence in order to get approval for a new medication. And I said, but if I can get you a medication that decreases the amount of drug that you are taking, it could be valuable. And they have not wanted to actually approve it on those bases. I said, you have to demonstrate that that is uh, clinically significant. So that's where we're trying to, to show that. Uh, and we're working with them, and, I, and, and we have some, some, uh, some interesting findings that hopefully the FDA would be willing to accept, because that would make it much easier to get a treatment. We may have medications that uh, decrease your consumption by 75%. That, that would be valuable. If you're on opioids, that decreases your chances of overdosing and dying. Yeah, yeah, no, but it is uh, complicated, and I think that, I mean, uh, the uh, FDA requires as a main outcome abstinence. That's it, abstinence. That's not the case for alcohol. They do allow for decreases in drinking days. The crisis right now, I think, is forcing all of us to recognize that we perhaps should be a little bit more open and flexible. And I think this is a good opportunity, and Janet Goodcock has been very, very helpful in trying to um, move forward. And she, in, in one of the meetings, I brought up the notion of would you consider um, approval of a medication if we can show that it decreases the number of overdoses? She says that could be potentially a good indication. So now we're actually looking into, into that, and, and there's some data the Vivitrol shows that you decrease the overdoses, the paper from Chuck O'Brien that came in the New England Journal of Medicine. There's a paper that's going to be coming up from John Roth Rosen from the CTN on the extended release buprenorphine that they showed also decreases in overdoses in their extended release compared to the others. So there may be an opportunity to, to make changes. The crisis is bringing us an opportunity to make changes. I'll tell you what we found in humans, because humans, we all have different levels of dopamine D2 receptors. And that's what I, what I was telling Dr. Gringard. So if, uh, and we've tried to understand how 
the differences in the expression of the receptors influences the, their responses, their behavioral responses to the drug. Individuals that have very high levels of dopamine D2 receptor for the doses, and we use intravenous methylphenidate because it's pharmacologically very similar to cocaine, but it has properties that makes it much safer. And um, when you give them with very high levels of receptor, the same dose that someone with low levels would uh, perceive as, as highly rewarding and reinforcing, for them it is aversive. So it, it's actually what uh, they are sensitive to much lower levels. For them, for them to be reinforcing, you have to give much, much lower levels. And what is drugs, what our drugs are doing is they are producing these massive increases in dopamine. So if you have very low levels of receptors, that are also going to make you much less sensitive to other reinforcers that are not as potent as drugs. And there go the, the question about what is it that we could do. If someone were to ask me what is it that you would like if you had a magical thinking, I would like an intervention that would allow us to upregulate the dopamine D2 receptors because this would basically increase the sensitivity to other reinforcers and drive your motivation because that system drives motivation, that dopaminergic system. But it's also fundamentally will also result in an improvement on the function of your prefrontal cortical area. But we don't, there's nothing that uh, is there clinically currently available. I think that, and I'm going to jump up in terms of the question, I, I, I think that now that we have uh, a means of understanding and we know that behavior, we're plastic, our brain is influenced by our environment, if we start to understand what behavioral interventions we may be able to do, are there certain things that could provide resilience by upregulating receptors? We're studying, for example, an area that we're studying right now in the laboratory is to um, investigate what factors are also responsible for this uh, up and down regulation of dopamine D2 receptors. And dopamine D2 receptors are actually modulating circadian rhythms for some of the, the clock genes. And long and behold, I mean, so themselves, they themselves are actually very susceptible to uh, sleep deprivation. So if, for example, if you sleep deprive, we sleep deprive uh, people, we downregulate the expression of these dopamine D2 receptors. And, and we are supposed to start a study that just has been delayed because of all of the bureaucratic messes that have happened in the clinical center to look at circadian variability of the dopamine D2 receptors in humans. Because the question is, why is it that we are better at uh, in inhibiting and resisting temptations in the morning than in the evening? Is it a circadian effect? Or is it just the function that as the day goes on, we are more tired and sort of lose that? But if we are more tired, what does that mean neurobiologically? And is that how that is influencing the dopamine D2 receptor system? So, understanding that there are other factors. This is not just a fix, but there's a variability in each one of us.